Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event, the online launch of Daniel McNeil's new book, Thinking While Black, Translating the Politics and Popular Culture of a Rebel Generation. Uh, my name is Sarah, and I'm staff at Between the Lines Books, the publisher of this fantastic book. We are so pleased to be hosting tonight's event with Daniel and this impressive panel of speakers. Uh, in a sh short moment, I will introduce our moderator uh, for the evening. Uh, Between the Lines is a social movements press founded in 1977. Uh, BTL is proudly left wing and the books we publish reflect our activist roots and our commitment to social justice struggles. Our press is situated in Takaranto, a traditional Wendat, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory subject to the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. Uh, this land was stewarded by the Mississauga of the Credit River and is home to many Indigenous people including the Métis and those displaced from their homelands by Canadian extractive and other industries. Uh, we welcome everyone joining today to reflect upon the lands on which you live and encourage you to work in solidarity with Indigenous social movements. Uh, this online book launch is being co-sponsored by an, Another Story Bookshop, um, and it's been made possible with support from the Government of Canada, the Canada Council for the Arts, Ontario Creates, and the Ontario Arts Council. Uh, now I will pass it off to our moderator for this evening, Adrian Harewood, uh, a longtime journalist and CBC host advocating for more diversity and inclusion in Canadian newsrooms. Uh, Adrian is now a full-time faculty member of Carleton University School of Journalism and Communication. So please take it away, Adrian. Okay, well, thanks so much, Sarah. And, and a very warm welcome to those of you who are joining us online from across Canada and around the world, I am delighted to be serving as the moderator for tonight's event. And I'm coming to you tonight from Ottawa, the unceded territory of the Algonquin. I am so pleased and honored to be here tonight to celebrate the launch of this new book, Thinking While Black, translating the politics and popular culture of a rebel generation by my friend, Professor Daniel McNeil from Queen's University. I had the immense privilege of studying with Daniel McNeil almost a decade ago when he was teaching at Carleton University in Ottawa. And I was embarking upon a graduate degree in history. Being a student in Daniel's class was a joy. As an instructor, he was brilliant, curious and engaging and imaginative and generous and demanding like all good instructors are. He was demanding in that he insisted that you make an investment, that you get stuck in and immerse yourself in the literature. He encouraged us to be thinking people, to be rigorous, to listen, and to consider the ideas of others, to question our preconceived notions. His interests were so eclectic, he opened up the world to me and my fellow classmates by alerting us to podcasts and movies, uh, alerting us to books that had not been on our radar. Indeed, to this day, I still consult the wonderfully rich syllabus he prepared for us in that class. It remains a thrill to pour, to pour over it. Daniel modeled the possibilities of what being an engaged scholar and organic intellectual could be. He introduced me to new ways of seeing and being in the world. Suffice it to say, the class remains one of the most treasured memories of grad school. And in the ensuing years, I've always appreciated his perspective and counsel. So needless to say, it is an honor for me to be here tonight. Now for the next hour, we will be engaging in a conversation with Daniel and the esteemed panel that has been assembled for tonight's event, including a very special guest. Audience members can ask questions in the chat on Zoom or YouTube. So right now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists. Catherine McKittrick is a professor in gender studies at Queen's University whose work focuses on Black studies, cultural geography, anti-colonialism, and diaspora studies. Kamari Maxine Clark is a distinguished professor at the Center for Criminology and Sociological Studies and the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies at the University of Toronto. And Armand White is an American film and music critic, and along with Paul Gilroy, one of the subjects of Daniel's book. We will be hearing from our panelists very soon, but first we will begin with Daniel McNeil, professor in the Department of Gender Studies and the Queen's National Scholar Chair in Black Studies 
and the author of this new book that is being launched tonight, Thinking While Black, Translating the Politics and Popular Culture of a Rebel Generation. Daniel will tell us a bit about this book and its origins. Daniel. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Um, there's a little bit in the book about Public Enemy, a little bit about Flavor Flav as an incredible hype man. And I have to say, if I ever need a hype person, I know where to go. Thank you so much for such an incredible introduction that was so generous, that speaks to wonderful possibilities, but also is a testament to your generosity. And I'll maybe say a little bit more about how your discipline, your hard work has also been an inspiration for me in the writing of this book as well. Um, but maybe before thinking through Adrian's incredible contributions, I'd like to thank everyone who's taken the time to join our Zoom call, uh, to stream the event on YouTube, and to think and work through a moment in time where we're often feeling drained and stimulated at the same time. Right? We have so many meetings on Zoom, on Teams, and for people to take the time to check into the Zoom event and the stream on YouTube, um, it means a lot. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who made this event possible, particularly Sura and the Between the Lines Collective, and the Independent Bookstore Another Story that co-sponsored the event. I've truly appreciated the opportunity to work with Between the Lines, a press that embodies cooperative and democratic ideals and takes a collaborative and consensus-based approach to decision-making. And Thinking While Black is aligned with Between the Lines aspirations and achievements as a press that archives and promotes struggles for a better world. The book spends time recording the struggles of people who got together, often outside of conventional politics, with the intention of changing things and creating more promising and fantastic futures. Um, it was a great joy, as Adrian alluded to, for me to scour the archives, to move across time and space to follow young people who rocked against racism in the UK by developing collective writing projects and movements that were always educational without being sermonizing about trade union movements, sexual and gender politics, and anti-racism. The theme of independence and autonomy is also critical to the book as well. Um, the book demonstrates why independent bookstores like Another Story matter as places where we can find writing that opens up new worlds and possibilities. It documents how independent bookstores like record stores and libraries are part of a black public sphere or a countercultural public sphere where it's possible to share ideas and counter exclusionary violence. Um, I was hoping in the book and I had the privilege of uh, recording how intellectuals like Paul Gilroy um, embarked on their journeys of intellectual discovery while they were puttering around bookstores, right? So Paul Gilroy encountering resistance through rituals in a bookstore, um, this was a life-changing experience that helped him to imagine and build an intellectual life and go off and work with intellectuals such as Hazel Carby and Stuart Hall, who knew that even academics could smuggle moments of dissidence into cultural climates where the life of the mind is often scorned. The book also documents how Armand passed through a convenience store and spotted Pauline Kale's kiss, kiss, bang, bang, twirling on a rack and found someone who helped him to imagine and build a life as someone with interesting and thoughtful things to say about race, America and the movies. And since the book is about individual self-fashioning and collective liberation, since it's about 
the structuring capacities of institutions as well as heroic, sometimes romantic, sometimes utopian visions of critics who stand as independent sources of information between advertising and an audience. I'm truly grateful to be on a panel with people who have done so much to help me think about how we might clarify confounding contradictions with control. I'm so grateful that Adrian, Kamari, Catherine and Armand have taken the time to be here this evening, especially because I know how busy they are. Um, Adrian alluded to classes at Carlton. I have fond memories of seeing Adrian rushing to classes, sometimes getting there late um, from his job at the CBC and contributing such rich and thought provoking reflections about how we can avoid the pitfalls of narrow scholasticism on one hand and superficial journalism on the other. And then rushing off as soon as class had finished and then at I'd see him presenting the nightly news and I just wonder, when does this guy sleep, you know? And similarly, Catherine is just such an incredible colleague that I hugely admire. Um, I remember a day last year when I saw her deliver a wonderful keynote at the Tate in the morning about how Paul Gilroy and Sylvia Winter and Glissant provide us with precious resources to think about pedagogy, cooperative listening and reading, and the revolutionary power of curiosity. And then I was with her in an administrative meeting in the afternoon, and she volunteered to take on all of these important and time consuming roles and serve as the department as a grad chair in the fall. And then she went and jumped straight into a class in the evening, which you know, while energizing and stimulating would also be incredibly draining. And Kamari similarly is a incredible colleague who's really helped me to think about this book, particularly in its early stages when we were both at Carlton. So um, one of the things I do as a historian is observe repetition. And the, com the term Kamari uses so astutely um, in many conversations is macro. Right? So she'd always ask me, where's the macro analysis? And she was often with me in spirit when I was wondering, how can I write a book about these important critics who were interested in cultural politics, but often frustrated by what they consider the totalizing schemes of macro political narratives? And I also loved how Kamari would bring questions about aesthetics back into conversation with reflections around political economy. And I'm truly grateful for how Kamari's interventions helped me to think a bit deeper about the commitments of Paul and Armand to um, walking um, the insinuating rhythms of uh, city life. Um, so maybe if I back up a little bit, one of the reasons I was drawn to the work of Paul and Armand in the early 2000s was their openness to communicating um, the signs in the street, right? So I appreciated how Armand's reviews would call out inauthentic portrayals of New York City subway operatives. I also valued Paul's ability to carefully observe the language and style of his fellow Londoners on buses and trains. I liked their refusal to take the over-dependence on the car and the obeisance to car culture for granted. It really spoke to me as someone who likes to ride around on my bike and take public transport. And Kamari would sagely point out, well, yes, but have you thought about how these commitments might run up against the practicalities of picking up kids from school or elderly relatives from care? Have you ever thought about how the partners of these intellectuals might be being asked to do that labor? And I'm grateful for those interventions, particularly because they didn't foreclose the utopian strands of the book or the more quotidian side of things. They just said, make sure that you connect these declarations about ethics and aesthetics to how people are living. 
So the book really spends a lot of time with unabashed uh, utopians. Sorry. I like your photo. No, it's not going. Um, who say, how can we conquer greedy and hostile culture industries with our rebel spirits? But there's also this more quotidian side of things. Um, how do we navigate institutions, media institutions, academic institutions that grant prestige and recognition? Um, how do we think about the practices and grammars they promote, the things that they can assume? Um, the articles about black public intellectuals in the 1990s that drew attention to the fancy cars of Cornel West, Bell Hooks, Henry Louis Gates, etc. How do we disrupt systems that say that or confuse or use the term black public intellectual always and only to refer to African American writers with ties to Ivy League universities and or prominent newspapers and magazines based in New York. Um, and maybe just as a final comment, thank you to Armand um, for being here. Your work has had a transformative impact on me, um, and I hope that it speaks to your interest in cultivating spaces for people to do some fresher and deeper thinking, uh, rather than merely agreeing with each other. Um, so in your work and Paul's work, I've found critics who consistently want to say something new or at least creatively recycle things um, to refuse to simply repeat blandishments, received opinion, what's always being said um, or what's already being said as well. Um, if we take seriously what you say about history films, for example, that they should avoid dishonest nostalgia, but also think about how to communicate and translate what happened in the past with vividness and vibrancy to contemporary audiences. Then our goal isn't to domesticate your work, to explain it or even to agree with it, but to translate it to our local contexts and our contemporary goals and needs. And yeah, think about how it can be repurposed. And there's a similar sense with Paul Gilroy's work, his distaste with the Lincoln Center jazz that's professional and routine, um, but often not lively and radical, right? It's simply repeating, um, domesticating, rather than thinking about how black art, black creativity is always stimulating when it's, um, a tradition, but a tradition that's ceaselessly in movement. Um, and maybe it's just the final comment before we hear all of the, the rich reflections from the audience and this wonderful panel. I'll just share a couple of anecdotes about how the book was shaped by listening to Armand and Paul, as well as reading their work, right? So as well as looking for repetition in the texts that they wrote, um, carefully studying post-colonial melancholia to see um, terms like depression that kept getting repeated and spoke to some of Paul Gilroy's frustration with life as an Ivy League professor, as well as combing Armand's work to think about what he actually means by discourteous discourse and a protest ethic or soulful style. Um, I also listen carefully to them. Um, this might mean listening to Paul talk about why he didn't watch the video of George Floyd's murder. It might mean listening to him talk about seeing Bob Marley in concerts, but also listening to him um, in panels like this one, but at uh, Tate Britain, where he'd make really important institutions to pierce through a certain Canadian do-gooder attitude. So one, the example I'm thinking of, Paul Gilroy talks about how there's a tendency for North American voices to drown out all others in transatlantic exchange. And a Canada researcher interjects and says, well, surely you just mean US voices. And Paul said, well, no, it's you lot as well. You've been selling multicultural snake oil to the world for years. 
and that incisiveness that you know sometimes caustic wit um helps us to think about how his work invites us to reflect about authentic multiculturalism lived multiculturalism where we're all bumping into each other on the street in the buses and all of us are transformed by the encounter and similarly i learned a lot from armand um, reading his reviews yes walking around new york with him seeing how a six foot three critic gracefully responds to new yorkers who are bullied and encouraged by journalists at the new york times to presume that black men of his size are quote unquote imposing or predisposed to violence but the example I'll end with is from the 1990s um, and something I could only access by dusting off those VCRs. And on the video, I saw him participate in a discussion about the role of the art editor with colleagues at the Village Voice and the New York Times. And I learned a lot from seeing Armand, um, whereas his colleagues had this flowery bohemianism or this kind of tweedy self-importance with a three-piece suit, Armand had his Doc Martens on. Um, and when he was asked, uh, does he accept screeners? He proclaimed, um, I can't be bought. And that defiance, that commitment drew him, drew me to his work, drew me to the work of Paul Gilroy and the political and cultural generation that came of age in the 1960s and 70s, consuming rebel music, revolutionary film, and other forms of expressive culture created by world citizens and the descendants of enslaved individuals. And it's that punk ethos, that protest ethic that I wanted to try and translate in this book. Thanks. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for you used the word incisive, you're a very incisive and, and soulful, very rich and dynamic uh, introduction. And I, I now like to ask our, our panelists to, to respond uh, to your, your opening. So I think I'll ask Catherine McKittrick if, if she'd like to, to say a few words. Catherine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kamari, Adrian, Armand, Daniel and Between the Lines Press and Another Story. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I, I'm, I have a few things, I mean, I, have a, I posed a bunch of questions when I was reading the book to kind of op think about opening, opening up the conversation. Um, but what I, but I'll, before I do that, I wanna just say how, how much I like this book and love this book. So there's a lot, there's a lot, Daniel knows this, because I'm always like, <laughs> there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of conversations. There's a lot of deep, deep, deep archival work, a, a kind of re-historicization, at least for me, of the 70s, particularly in the work of Paul Gilroy, but also art, pairing that with Armand's work and thinking about a counterculture of journalism and what that means and the kind of what that opens up for us politically. Um, so one of my, my big questions, I think for this, and, and this is maybe something that we can talk about together, is, is the role of the archive, because archives are so, so hot, right? I mean, we're just, all, everything is an archive. But what I'm not really interested, Daniel, necessarily in what, what, the, what the archive is, you know, I think it's clear because you're a historian, but rather, how you what you what you did with the art like what 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 do you do with the archive how did you find these archives i mean i was just i was i'm just amazed by the detail um and and i think that that's the the beauty of this book is the detail of those counter narratives that you've pulled out and you're asking us to think you're you're illuminating a different intellectual history so that's one thing that I'm thinking about. The other thing that I'm thinking about is the context of the 1970s. So rather than the 1960s, I know that a stuff is brewing over, but what it, what's how the 1970s is a meaningful um, uh, moment for us to think about the work of Armand 
and Paul Gilroy. So the tail end of the 1960s, um, when, when, uh, when civil rights fashion starts to shift and become a site of consumerism. And so there's, there's this, there is that moment in the 70s that I'm very interested in that you've pulled out as well here. Um, so that's the other, the uh, my other response. And this is, I don't know if this is more of a question for you, Daniel, or for Armand, but I think that Daniel, when you when you began speaking with us, you did talk about exhaustion and tiredness. And I do think a lot about that, the, the work of people who are defiant and the work of people who are heretics. In my world, that's Sylvia Winter um, and who continually push up against mainstream ideas, prevailing knowledge systems. They offer us uh, um, these gifts that are clues about how to live the world differently, um, but it's exhausting. Um, I think that's maybe more of a comment, um, but I, maybe that's something that we can think about um, how, how this mean, how this, how, how tiring this meaningful work is. Um, and, and, and how in some ways, so you called it a protest ethic. And so how that gets attached to our well being. Um, and and the other the other comments that you made about Kamari's question, who enables us to have to do this, right? Who enables who enables um, particular people to have a protest ethic that is exhausting? Um, what's the political economy behind that? And then my final comments. I mean, I could talk. Uh, I won't talk about it. Um, we want. I want to. We should talk a little bit about music. But in so so, let's end with Richard. Okay, so so what what is what is the black fantastic here in thinking while black for you? What can't be tracked, or what is sort of nested in modernity and the violence of coloniality, but what can't be what can't be enclosed by that? Where is the fantastic here? Um, is it in the music? Is it in the the archival materials? Is it in the film? Um, and this is that's that's something for you to sort of playfully engage with as well. Okay. Catherine, thanks so much. Kamari. Okay. Thanks, Adrian, and um, for the introduction. And of course, to Daniel for your graciousness. I, I do have fond memories of those walks and discussions. And I had to laugh uh, when you reminded me of the of the former question about uh, who carries whom where. Uh, but I guess that's for another day. Of course, thanks to Between the Lines Press and A Different Story for co-sponsoring today. It really is an op a wonderful opportunity to engage. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, reading Thinking While Black, both in its earlier manuscript form and uh, this later uh, book form and, and really have appreciated the provocations for considering the possibilities of Black radical thought its, and its relationship to the search for new archives for the Black intellectual tradition. Now, what is Thinking While Black? What is the invitation to engage that Daniel McNeil is offering us and what forms of politics and alliance shape such thought? And when such forms of social thought are aligned with neoliberal capital, how are they complicit in the reinforcement of the very fictions of racial difference that we're attempting to elide? Daniel McNeil's Thinking While Black is a phenomenal contribution to the corpus of contemporary Black thought. By taking seriously the life histories and the particularities of some of the most intellectually impactful thinkers of our time, certainly that of Paul Gilroy and Armand White, Daniel engages in an impressively thorough detailing of the life histories, writing, and in intellectual disagreements that shape their commitments. And of course, what we see is to do this, he, Daniel went in search of an approach to Black social thought that was artful, inventive, in its tying together as of what might loosely be seen as in fact two divergent public intellectuals. And it's really wonderful to have Armand White here with us. Uh, 
but one of the, the many ties that converged in the book was not only the pre and post civil rights period in which both were writing and thinking, but also the politics of difference that defined both their centrality and exclusions in their reflect, reflective respective fields. With Gilmour and, and White, Daniel discovered two public intellectuals from different life trajectories whose unique lives offered ways of translating the cultural work of a rebel generation. Thinking While Black considers the uptake of both public intellectuals work in various forms, from multimodal to musical to filmic, uh, to the frameworks that they introduced, and in many ways, both in so many ways, push us to think otherwise about knowledge formation and the disjunctures of the Black Atlantic world. In the case of White, a film critic, Daniel pays attention to his punditry and political and social work, as well as the new forms of filmic and artistic review that he brought to Black cultural production. In the case of Gilroy, it was his commitment to the to and taking on discussions of modernity, of hybridity, of double consciousness, of the, the, the forms and manifestations of the oral uh, in the context of inequality. Much of that was at the, the heart of his writing and his concerns. And while White and Gilroy are quite different in their approaches, one might think that Daniel might have moved to accentuate those differences, but in fact, instead, Daniel explores a kind of pedagogy at play or a different kind of pedagogy at play. It's a pedagogy, as he says, of black disagreement and de debate that's constitutive of, as he says, solidarity and love rather than barriers to them, which I thought was very interesting and a provocative way of thinking about the convergences and divergences of, of, of both thinkers. So thinking while Black then is interested in the coming of age and processes that led to the emergence of radical politics or their radical politics and new ways of analyzing cultural production in different formats. By selecting writers and thinkers who, whose new archives for making sense of racial unrest, Daniel framed as revolutionary, we see his attempt to for understanding particular types of black intellectuals in a particular set of social conditions that ushered in late 20th century social and institutional change. Now I'm thinking about what Daniel didn't do. The book that he wrote didn't involve the usual detailing of the life of Franz Fanon or W.B. Du Bois or Manning Marable, Toni Morrison, Walter Rodney as innovators of some form of Black radical or rebel tradition. Instead, thinking while Black involves a phenomenally insightful articulation of the disagreements and the challenges of Black and transnational public life. It weaves together explosive reconfigurings of Blackness in, in motion against capitalist consumerism for, for Gilroy or Blackness through a particular American existentialism for white. And both of course are critical for reconceptualizing 20th century race in the Black Atlantic world. So my, my reflections and ending reflections today take up McNeil's invitation to ponder what, how we are to understand the, this domain of the transnational and Black Atlantic public life in the contemporary period. I, I really did see that as his invitation, the takeaway, uh, one of the, the many trajectories that formed the takeaway here. And, and in, in many ways, the question, what are its potentials? So what are the potentials of Black Atlantic public life? Um, what are its limits, especially as it relates to the forms of co-optation at play uh, with Black thought today? And of course, by co-optation, I'm talking about those things that have become mainstream in academic uh, public publishing, uh, in academic work, in, in, in public blogs, in uh, publications that are central to Black Atlantic engagement. So from books and articles being titled by editors and publishers, not the writers themselves, to biographies being written to build credibility, to name chairs and hierarchies or funding and promotion and citational practices that reflect a different set of politics that interlocutors in this book actually pushed against. With this contemporary backdrop, I'm, I'd like to end with by pondering two sets of inquiries 
The first line of inquiry concerns how Black public intellectuals, in this case Gilroy and White, might help us to understand a particular genealogy of the present through which to think about the shift from Black studies in its more rebel form to, in many ways, what, what seems to be a shift to multiculturalism, to the institutionalization of area studies, which we've seen in, in especially in US contexts, and to some extent in Canada, African-American, Africana studies, et cetera, to the recent emergent of widespread ethnic studies, hyphenated studies, diasporic identity, um, whiteness studies that decentered attention to racism, to, to really this, this contemporary moment in which white supremacy studies of racism and settler colonialism through new uh, newly popularized BIPOC alliances, as well as the EDI measures are being made possible with recent decolonizing demands. And so to ponder this genealogy in, in, in many ways involves considering the way that certain forms of radical protest took shape alongside particular political alignments. So this first question is concerned with the way that these alignments in the emergence of African-American studies or Black Atlantic studies or Black studies have everything to do with what we might say is an ideological taming of race studies or has been uh, African-American studies or ethnic American studies in the US and certainly its, its manifestation in different ways in Canada. And so I would ask how Gilroy's map, how Daniel's mapping of Gilroy and White as part of a rebel generation might, might help us to illuminate politically the shift that has have happened to bring us to this moment of Black public intellectuals in neoliberal contexts, in contemporary neoliberal contexts, academics certainly in the publishing world, in the, the public media domains in, in which White also writes. The, the second um, set of questions has to do with what changed, what has changed when we reflect on the 1950s, 60s, uh, and what does that have to do with the uh, accommodationist tenants that are at play in, in the story that McNeil maps. What he shows us is how new forms of intellectual and material labor within Black culture popular culture were redefined by the university, by governments, by pundits, on media and blogs and so forth. And if we're to agree that the turn to multiculturalism and multicultural capital has had implications for not only our complicity in, in shaping a, a race industry within academic disciplines, but also reducing the pools of possibility for radical change, then my second line of inquiry really asks what changed in the shift from the 1950s to this moment? Was the change a manifestation of the ideological taming of race uh, within particular accommodationist tenants that were propelled and placated by corporate capital, in fact, in many of the domains within which we write? And if so, how might that ideological taming of, of race studies be understood in, in these contexts in Canada from which some of us are, but as well the, the recent emergence of, of black studies. Are there parallel figures that have emerged in Canadian contexts that, uh, or it, is there something different about this moment as it's played, played out here? And, and so I, I end with those two questions, those two sets of trajectories, um, really to celebrate the invitation to, to ponder that genealogy of the present. What does that say about this moment and what are the possibilities and what gets delimited with the, the ways in which these forms of neo neoliberal intellectualism have taken shape? There certainly isn't enough time to go further, but I, I'll leave you today with, with those final reflections and much gratitude goes to Daniel for this wonderful and truly ambitious project that reframes the emergence of, of this trajectory of thought. And in, in many ways, I think it really is a model of a type of analytics that uh, is, is really a standard for thinking about interrogating these Black Atlantic traditions in the contemporary period. Thanks, and I'll end there. Mari, thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'd now like to ask Armand White uh, to say a few words. Armand. Oh, thank you, Adrian. 
And thank you, Daniel, and, and all of you for being here and, and to, I say, celebrate Daniel's book and, and all, the, all the work and sincerity that went into it and that I think shows uh, my, I'm, my gratitude must be stated and it's, and it's genuine. Uh, what I want to say to other, the other panelists, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to join you all, is that uh, what I do as a critic and what Daniel has recognized and, and connected to the work of Paul Gilroy is, is so flattering to me. And uh, uh, the flattery, there's flattery, <laughs> I can't help but feel that there's flattery in being understood. And trying to be understood is, is the work of, of a writer. Uh, writing is what I do. I try to communicate ideas. And uh, some readers get them, some readers don't. But when readers do get them, I am genuinely flattered and, uh, and, and grateful for the opportunity. Uh, the opportunity is something that Daniel records in his book. Uh, ha having gone through the archives and, uh, and searched out articles that I thought were were simply in the past, and he brought them back again to often to my memory, but now also to the attention of, of, a, of a new reading public. And uh, in that writing, uh, the opportunity to have done that writing is something that I, I would like to explain to you younger folks and, and hope that, uh, that you are as inspired by what Daniel has done as I am tonight inspired by all the words that were said prior to me speaking. Um, I, write, I write in a tradition and the tradition that I write out of is not just a literary tradition, it's also a, a family tradition, a cultural tradition. And, it's, and everything I write comes from what I've learned, comes from what I've been taught, uh, comes from what I've experienced, but also largely from what I've been taught. And, and my education in, in the public school system of, of my youth, meaning the 1960s and 70s, was a, was a system that taught me to, to take in as much knowledge, as much of the world as possible, and then to study it, to learn it, and then uh, transform it through my understanding of it. So the teachers I've had in life are, I think, I hope, are reflected in everything I have I've written. And this, I think, is, is how it must be for a, for a serious writer, for a sincere writer. Uh, you have to reflect who you are, what you think, and that, can't, that then cannot help but reflect where you're from. So in all the writings that I've done, uh, I think it's important to understand where I have been allowed to write, where, have been, where I have been graced to write. I've never written for, well, let me say this in a, general, in a general fashion. I've never written for what's known as a mainstream publication. I've, I've always written for what you might consider to be marginal or the old fashioned term alternative publications. And it is the existence of these publications uh, that we need to give honor to and give respect to. Uh, I started writing as a college student in my college paper, in my Wayne State University paper, which is right across the river from Mount Windsor, Ontario, Canada. So I, I do have a connection to Canada, you guys. I, I grew up with it. Uh, and then when I, when I came to New York, I, I got a job at a place, at a, at a magical place <laughs> called The City Sun. And the City Sun is a black owned newspaper, not out of Manhattan, but out of Brooklyn, New York, which is a different kind of Brooklyn than, than it is today. And the City Sun was owned and run by intelligent Black people, Black people with, with, a, with a political sense as well as an ethical and moral sense. Uh, these would be Andrew Cooper and Eutrice Lead. And the opportunity they gave me to write is, is, a, is, is a precious thing. Uh, they put no limits on me. Uh, they understood that I was interested in bringing to the readership that they, that they addressed through the City Sun, I wanted to bring to them what was given to me, which was an understanding that the world is out there. You are part of it. You, you should take part of it. It's yours, <laughs> grab it, but then understand it. Understand it and think about it 
and, and be critical in your thinking about it. Uh, know it's there, take part in it, uh, enjoy it, but also, also be critical of it. Always think about it. Uh, Dan's book is called Thinking While Black. Uh, thinking is absolutely important. I think it's the idea, I believe, I believe thinking is the idea I want to communicate to anybody who reads what I write. Um, don't accept received opinion. Think for yourself as a way of understanding your own feelings and also as a way to better understand the world that you are part of. Uh, uh, to quote Scarface, the world is yours. Uh, don't feel that it's not yours. And also, though, it's a world you must share. And it's also a world you must share in your exchange of ideas and exchange of emotion and feelings. The exchange of ideas, emotions, and feelings is what I like about the arts. It's why I listen to music. It's why I write, why I watch movies. Uh, it's why I read what I read. And uh, this is something not, not to be forgotten. And uh, I guess you could say there, there's probably a political aspect to that. But I like to think that there is a living aspect to that. It's, the way, it's a way to live better, uh, to appreciate the arts, to appreciate the experiences of others and see yourself in their experiences, and to understand that, that through art, uh, we get to know ourselves better as we get to know the world. Okay, there's that point. But also, let me get back to the City Sun and the other alternative press that I, was, I am fortunate to have written for. Um, the mainstream exists. Uh, people who grant status and uh, quote unquote authority exists. But uh, you have to be your own, uh, you have to confer authority upon yourself as well. And you also have, also have to help others to do it. Uh, the beautiful thing, as I think back on, on my city Sundays, well, actually, it also goes for my New York press days and currently at uh, National Review is that uh, those publications, those non-mainstream publications, uh, are worth their while because they allow difference of opinion. Otherwise, I wouldn't be there. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't print. Uh, that's the proof of it. And, uh, and uh, I think, Catherine, you said something about, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, uh, how did we get to where we are and then where are we? If I'm not misstating it, I don't mean to do that. But, uh, but I want to say this about, about the publications that I've written for. Uh, everything I write comes from the foundation of uh, the Black folks who ran City Sun, as well as my family. Uh, the City Sun was created by Black people. Black people can always do it. Uh, the beautiful thing about the City Sun from 1984 to 1996 is that it ignored the existing mainstream media and created media of its own. And, and for that time period, it was a force in this city. It was a force in New York that nobody could deny. And I wanna say to, to you younger folks, take that as your example. Uh, you don't have to join the mainstream. You can create your own platform and you can make it good. Uh, footnote here, uh, the oldest black newspaper in New York City is a paper called the Amsterdam News. I don't mean to drag on anyone else. The, the Amsterdam News has been around for a long time, and that took a lot of hard work, I'm sure. But uh, in the 1980s, it had, it had fallen down, it had slackened. And in point of fact, the owner of uh, the City Sun, Andrew Cooper, worked briefly for the Amsterdam News, and he came to realize that it wasn't good enough, that Black people deserved better, which is why he left and started his own publication. Uh, this was a venture. Uh, this was a vision uh, to pay attention to and to honor and to repeat. I say that because in my awareness, uh, uh, contemporary Black media hardly exists in, in a journalistic sense. I don't, I don't know of a, of a Black publication, journalistic publication uh, that can be taken seriously or that is worthy of its prospective audience. And we need that. And uh, I, would, I would encourage anyone, well, especially you guys and people you know, uh, to do that uh, once you leave the university or in addition to being in the university. Uh, it's important to have, your own, to have your own media. 
And it's important to have a media that would allow you to say how you feel and to demonstrate how you think and to demonstrate your independence. Uh, if you can do that, you are then following the tradition, the same tradition that, that inspired me, uh, which was the tradition of people like Harold Cruz, George Schuyler, uh, Malcolm Cowley, John Ruskin, Pauline Kell, Andrew Saris. Uh, that's an honorable tradition and uh, part of the world we live in and part of the world and that we must seize and, and not be ashamed of and just become part of. I hope that that's a good response to, to, to the wonderful things that have been said before. Thank you so much, Armand. And, and you've really honored all of us uh, by being here, by being present uh, this evening. We really do, do appreciate just this opportunity to, to engage with you. Um, Daniel, th there's a lot there. <laughs> a, a, lot, a lot has been said, and, and I'm wondering perhaps, you know, in the time that we have left, clearly we need a symposium, I think. Um, but, but in the time that we have left, perhaps you can respond to the responders. You, you know, you, I, I know that you were listening attentively there. What, 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 what do you want to say to the responders? Well, th thank you is <laughs> the, the primary response. Um, thank you for the engagement, for the provocations. Um, what stood out to me as Catherine was speaking um, about the archive and about exhaustion. I had a couple of thoughts. Um, one, engaged with a Black Studies reading group that we were part of this afternoon, that kind of stimulated the thought that Black Studies involves, Black thought involves exacting work without extractive work. Right? That was one way of thinking about uh, how Armand spoke to demands, spoke to uh, the pressure of the work, how it's exacting, but also the ethics of doing so in a fashion that is generous, that is open-ended and isn't um, parasitical um, and isn't extractive. Um, what I appreciated a lot around Kamari's interventions was to think through this idea of um, erstwhile radicals moving into the boardrooms, moving into the um, university seminar spaces and asking for grant funds for their subversive activities. I'm kind of paraphrasing Paul Gilroy's reflections. Um, and what I wanted to try and think about in the book is, yes, how do we speak to the aspirations of soul rebels that say, how do we speak truth to power? How do we take an oppositional stance? But I also wanted to take seriously the idea that it's possible to smuggle moments of dissidence into commodified cultures, right? So as much as there is this aspiration, how do we conquer greedy and hostile culture industries with our rebel spirit? There's also an awareness around what are some of the forms of revolutionary activity in a minor key? Uh, what are the ways in which by paying attention, we can open up new spaces. And so to come back to Catherine's idea around the archive and this notion of things being exhausting, and also to come back to Armand's idea about what it is to be seen, part of what this project involved was taking seriously figures who are often misrecognized and unseen. Right, so I wanted to, by taking seriously what Paul Gilroy mentions about um, his early career, it opens up space to say, well, why don't people talk about the Paul Gilroy that was writing before 
the Black Atlantic or before there ain't no Black in the Union Jack? Why is there that absence? Mm -hmm. um, similar to the kind of questions around, you know, why don't we know more about the films that Franz Fanon watched? Why do we focus so intently on this rampant textuality, the books that are commodified a little bit more easily and um, these kind of discrete publishing moments? Why don't we do the work to search out these scattered um, pieces of information that may be in an archive elsewhere, that may be um, in a podcast, that may just not be as easily accessible and digestible as the things that are shared in mainstream newspapers and outlets. And maybe one final point about the archive. I was pushed into this project. I was provoked into this project by seeing what wasn't there, right? By seeing um, the bland corporate media in the 2000s and the independent press that Armand speaks about in the City Sun. Um, had died, like the print media, at least, um, had been seized, um, kind of lost its battle against Craigslist and digital media. And so what I wanted to do is go back to certain types of archives, certain types of work where that independent media wasn't in need of palliative care, but was actually lively, vibrant. And as Armand articulated, some of that archive is um, articles that he didn't have a full um, record of or a full, a full archive of in his possession. So it was it was great to share that with him. And similarly with Paul Gilroy, he didn't have access to the work that he was producing to, with full city limits in the 1980s when he was juggling a career working for the militant Greater London Council, as well as um, his work as a music journalist, as well as his work um, as a lecturer. And so addressing that type of work, which again, to speak to Kamari's point, emerges in strange places. So it was strange to read City Limits, this radical archive of collective protest in London, not in London, but in the archives of Harvard University, right? And so that, that kind of engagement with where are these archives housed? How do we have access to them? And while I, sh I share Armand's aspirations to say, here's how we think about what's possible. It's also a reflection around what types of material are in our public spheres, what types of material are people searching out so that we can imagine these promising and fantastic futures, so that we can do that reconstructive intellectual work to ensure that those struggles in the past are not erased, not forgotten, um, not considered um, too much work, too exacting for us to search for. And that's maybe a way to bring back Richard Eitan's work too. I mean, his work is In Search of the Black Fantastic. That fantastic is not just a, a future orientated perspective, but also a perspective in terms of how do we acknowledge the joy in against sorrow that people have found and pursued um, in the past as well. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I, I can, um... Well, first, first of all, I, it, I think what we're going to do is we're going to extend the conversation. If, if people are, if, if people are open to that idea, we, we seem to have the the number of participants is held, so no one has left, and, and so that that suggests to me that 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 we can spend a little bit more more time. Um, so I'd just like to invite uh, those of you who are in our audience, if you have any questions, or if you have any uh, interventions that you'd like to make, certainly if you can post it in the chat and we'll try to incorporate it into the conversation. Um, you know, Daniel, you, you, you've you mentioned, uh, and, and I think Kamari pointed to this, you, 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 I think you, you talk about your attraction to these two thinkers, and, and, and part of your attraction is a kind of ethical commitment that they have 
to disagreement, uh, that this kind of commitment they have to conversation and debate um, and, and the ability to kind of engage with people who uh, you know, have, have different orientations, perhaps political orientations, but, but, but engage with them perhaps in, in, in a civil manner. Um, just to reflect on, on, on my own kind of background, I, I remember reading The City Sun um, in the early 1990s in, in Montreal, going to school in, in, in Montreal, and how thrilling it was for me and, and my, my comrades, my contemporaries at the time, to read that newspaper, uh, to read the likes of Eutrus Lead and, 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 and Armand. Um, and and I, I will say that, and, and again, this is for, for, for Armand and, and, and Daniel, I, I was surprised and, 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 and perhaps a little bit shocked, Armand, when I saw your work appearing in the National Review. Um, and, I, and I say that because I read the National Review as a kind of paper that, and I read it on a regular basis, actually, but I, I read it to kind of understand the other side, uh, to try to understand the, um, the, 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 the kind of some, some of the leading figures of white supremacy, uh, you know, the William Buckley's of, of, of the world. Like, of course, the, the National Review was his paper. And, and so I was always curious as to how you made the decision to, to move to that paper and, and, and what you see as being the kind of ethical commitments of the National Review. And, and, and I'm curious, Daniel, as to how you see Armand's connection to the National Review. Does that matter? Does it matter where his work appears? Perhaps Armand, I can ask you that. I can, I can ask you that question. Okay, well... In the spirit of uh, Daniel's anecdote about Paul Gilroy to the Canadians, uh, don't forget the white supremacists in the mainstream liberal press that you're accustomed to, such sure. as the New York Times. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a bastion of white supremacy. Don't think there's only one. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, where am I? <laughs> I'm at National Review. What does that tell you about the difference between an institution like the New York Times and an institution like National Review, if you want to call that institution as well. Okay, why not? Uh, there's a difference there. Uh, I'm an example of the difference. I'm an example of how uh, quote unquote liberals have closed themselves and, uh, and how conservatives have opened up. Uh, the National Review isn't what it used to be. Uh, so there's no need to hold on to old ideas of what it once was when now it's new. And now it's different. And it's, it's far more open, uh, far more accommodating to different voices. Uh, it, sponsors, it sponsors a Black American critic. Uh, how much more could you ask for? Uh, whenever you read anything in the National Review, uh, there are a number of different bylines there. And you have to understand that these are the expressions of discrete individuals. Uh, as the saying goes, it's not a monolithic publication. Uh, but it is a publication that has, that has uh, certain uh, consistent ethics, and I share those ethics as well as, as most of the other writers there. But I've never written for any publication where I agree with everybody on everything. But uh, it's, it's a smart enough publication, it's a humane enough publication that I feel honored to be presented there. Uh, and so keep that in mind. Uh, I forget, uh, was, it, was it Kamari or Catherine who, who said earlier on, wondering how, how things have changed from the 50s and 60s to now? Uh, well, here's how they've changed. Uh, they've changed in terms, in these real terms, that there has been progress. And part of that, pro and the proof of that progress is, is there is access for Black people uh, to speak, to join the public conversation. Uh, I've been allowed to join that conversation at the National Review, not allowed to join it in places like the New York Times. Think about that. Uh, that's progress, that's access, that's open to black people. Uh, we have to, we should never ever forget that there is progress, there has been progress uh, and, uh, and follow that and continue that kind of, the kind of growth in, 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 social, in social relations that growth in intellectual expression, um, it's real. Uh, so, so how was that? Does that answer you, Adrian? It does. No, th thank you. Thank you for that. 
Daniel. Mm -hmm. Great question, Adrian. Um, what I liked about it is also how it invites us to think about the structuring capacities of institutions. And my reading of Armand's work is not just that he seeks to enter into institutions, enter into public spheres, but to transform them. Right? So in writing for the National Review, the goal is not simply to parrot the anti-anti-Trumpism. The goal is also to transform the terms of debate. Right? And that's kind of what we were trying to think about with smuggling moments of dissidence in, but also thinking about truth-telling directness. And maybe to refer, return to one of the things that Armand said, the power of being seen, right? It, it seems significant here uh, to share one anecdote. Um, the last time we met in New York, I was with my partner uh, who's um, born in the Philippines. And Armand saw her and talked about um, films that conveyed tension, love between Asian Americans, right? And so there was this moment where it was helpful to think about Armand's generational identity, where he sees someone and notes, as he's talked about in terms of family, he's talked about it in relation to people's family, culture, racialization. But he's picking up from that, the idea that someone, a member of that family can say, I see you. And that in saying, I see you, that's powerful. And part of what we can think through with Adrian's question is not just what does it mean to write in a particular institution, but if Armand writes for the National Review, is he seen? Is he seen by the conservative readers of that publication? Is he seen by people who are regular consumers of the New York Times and dismiss that outlet and say that he is unserious um, or can't be taken seriously? And that's probably how I'd reframe the question in terms of saying, okay, what does it mean to enter into these institutions? And in doing so, are we sacrificing our autonomy or are we actually providing an opportunity to transform that publication, institution, mm -hmm. etc.? And how do we think through that tension? Mm -hmm. Catherine, you, you you looked like you wanted to to, to interject. Did, did you did you have something to add to that? Um, no, I think I think it's uh, it, no. I, there's questions, but I bleh, I'm thinking a lot about. Um, uh this this idea of of be, well being seen but also one of the things that really stands out in Daniel's book one of the comments he makes about both Gilroy and Armand and Armand repeated it is the seriousness of their work and the rigor of their work and their commitment to that work so regardless of kind of the context through which they're writing, um, like the context that they're, they're producing, they're producing work that is committed to liberation. And I think that that's very important. And this is maybe we'll go back to Kamari's question is what, what can we learn from rebel thinkers, you know, from, from the 50s, 60s, 70s, what kind of lens do they provide for us to understand our, our situation right now, understand it better? Um, and, and that, I think, is one of the things. It's to do good work, to do your best work, to think about new ways to carve out liberatory practices or to notice those practices that are already happening. Um, and Armand gave us a clue, and it was it's important to have your own media, right? It's important to sort of think through how you communicate your ideas. Um, and so if we pair that with the rigor and the seriousness of these two thinkers, because they're not slacking off, 
you know, <laughs> they are not slapping off. They are committed to liberation and they're digging deep. And so what, you know, that's a lesson, I think. That's a pedagogy, a beautiful pedagogy that's linked to um, all sorts of Black methodologies and um, and ways of navigating white supremacy. Uh, so for me, the venue, the venue does matter, but it's also what we're doing in that venue because these these universities that we live in are are sites of terror for some of us, right? They're sites of white supremacy, patriarchy, um, and violence. So, but they're but they also produce the conditions for us to imagine new worlds. And so I think that that's really the beautiful thing about this book um, is how do we, what, like, what, what, what narratives are those, those archives providing for us that Daniel is then translating that are lessons, these these lessons in, in living the world differently and, and writing the world differently, but also being like rigorous scholars, you know? There's a, there's a note from a Nicholas Rickards and he says, Armand, it's amazing to hear you speak, brother. Uh, and, and then Nicholas goes on to say, Armand, I consider your rhetoric on par with the likes of Malcolm X. It is an absolute privilege to be able to hear you speak. I have finished this book and I'm writing a review of it for an academic journal. I could not let go of the idea that rebellion comes at a cost and rebellion ain't cheap. What is the cost of keeping the fire of a soul rebel burning? And are the hardship, hardships you may have faced because of your rebelliousness worth the production of the important work you have done? Armand. Uh, what is the cost? Uh, Let's think about what are the benefits. Uh, the benefits are, are that I get to express myself. Uh, the benefit is that I get to hear a compliment like that, which, which makes me blush. Uh, that's the benefit of it. Uh, and also more seriously, uh, early in the conversation, tonight's conversation, I, 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 I wanted to say something about uh, that in my writing, I'm, I always strive to say something that has not been said before. Otherwise, why do it? And to be given the opportunity to say something that hasn't been said before and to have it presented in a platform where people can access it, uh, that's a benefit. Uh, if it costs something, the cost is minor compared to that. I'm not, I'm not wealthy, but but I, I get to I get to express myself, and that's that, that cannot be quantified uh, financially, frankly. Uh, I used to joke the only thing better the only thing better than getting paid is being read, and I, I believe that I, I to be read is, is, is a it's a blessing, and so uh, <laughs> you make sacrifices in life. And so uh, why, why bore anybody talking about those sacrifices? Because everybody sacrifices to some degree. Uh, but to be able to thank God for the benefits is, is, is what I'm happy to do and remind any readers of that. Mm -hmm. Armand, I'm just curious as to how you understand your own evolution, how you understand the changes that you have undergone over the last 40, 50 years. You know, in, in, in Daniel's book, and I'm just paraphrasing here, he says in 1975, as a brash critic, uh, Armand White denounced the crudeness and the Hollywood flash of Spielberg's jaws, but eventually his views changed. As a middle-aged critic, he praised jaws as a revitalization of forgotten silent film aesthetics, along with a new good humored sensibility. How do you understand some of the kind of changes that you've undergone as a critic? Well, part of the reason why I wanted to do my book, uh, Make Spielberg Great Again, is to be honest about uh, one's, one's evolvement, evolving. Um, listen, Jaws, when Jaws came out, I was, I was 22 years old. If I haven't learned anything since being 22, then I've, then I've wasted my time here. Uh, you learn things and you, and you, try, to, you try to be better than what you were. You try, you try to know more than you used to know. 
Uh, you try to be more open, frankly, as a human being. And so that's what happened. Uh, nothing to be ashamed of. I think it's a, it's a natural process of, of maturity, of education. And, and so that's what happened. But we've come full circle with Spielberg because he's, he's in trouble now, <laughs> which is the point of make Spielberg great again. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but this is what happens to everyone, I think. Uh, when you're young, when you're young, you think you know everything. And one, pro one, one aspect of, of, of maturity is that you realize how little you first knew. Uh, movies don't change, we do. And that's, that's what happens. That's what happens when you deal with the arts. Uh, I used, to, I used to love as a kid the, the, Johnny, the Johnny Rivers record, uh, Mountain of Love. Uh, it still makes me smile, but it's, it's not a record that means as much to me now as it did when I was a child. This, this is what happened. This is natural. Mm -hmm. Daniel, you, you've been swimming in Paul Gilroy's and, and, and Armand's White's work for, for years now. You, you mentioned in the book that you've literally read thousands of, of Armand's articles. How do you understand some of the changes that Armand has gone, undergone as a thinker over the last 50 years? I think like Armand, I'd speak to the continuities as well as the changes. So yes, if we look at individual filmmakers, if we look at individual films, there are changes, there are changed perspectives, there are contradictions. And as Armand articulates, those contradictions are part of what it is to be human. But if we look at the the core, i.e. what are the axiological um, approaches, what are the, the core principles with which Armand um, understands, evaluates film and expressive culture, what actually strikes me is how remarkably consistent it has been, right? remarkably consistent, right, in terms of the films that Armand values are films that um, not only are providing us with a challenge to the mainstream, but the films and, and why the Spielberg example is useful, the film and the music that he especially values and esteems is one that spreads out to transform popular culture. So Spielberg in the 1980s, Prince, Michael Jackson, are figures that Armand associates with this ability to transform American culture and global culture um, to help us address authentic multicultural realities, not multiculturalism as refracted by the New York Times, not multiculturalism as refracted by what Paul Gilroy would call McKinsey, corporate um, multiculturalism, but the multiculturalism that he was engaging with in punk concerts on um, these convivial settings where people came together who wouldn't otherwise have come together. And in that process of connecting, they were able to imagine things that they couldn't do on their own. Um, and maybe just the other thing that I'd say in terms of some of the terms that we've used, um, the terms like seriousness and terms like cost um, or even richness, what I value incredibly about Armand's positionality, Paul Gilroy's positionality is that ability to challenge the idea of how richness is perceived in mainstream culture. So for Armand's cultural criticism, it doesn't, <laughs> that the question around box office, the question around how many times a record is streamed on a streaming service like Spotify is not the primary interest. The primary interest is not the monetization of culture. Culture is rich when it is stimulating, 
when it brings reality into focus, when it jolts us into some fresher and deeper thinking, when it opens up new worlds beyond capitalist systems of judgment and value. Those are rich kind of forms of culture, not the forms of culture that um, are heavily promoted and do well at the box office. And similarly, when we talk about seriousness, I sometimes worry that um, when we say something is serious, some people may read that as dull, boring, drab, right? And I think what's really important about the work of the Soul Rebels that I'm thinking with is that for them, seriousness is never dull, is never literal minded, is really sanctimonious. It is... Um, and it and it refuses the idea that to be dull and sanctimonious is the price of the ticket to be taken seriously. Seriousness is actually um, avoiding a spirit of seriousness, avoiding strain seriousness. Um, by that I mean um, the type of strain seriousness of most films that win Oscar, most historical films that win Oscars is this kind of strained seriousness, and the seriousness that I see in the work of Paul Gilroy and, and Armand White that I value is this sense of taking seriously black working class and black working class humor um, that is bitter, um, but not despondent. Kamari, I, I, I know that you- oh, something, something Sure, go ahead, Armand. What, what Daniel said. And also to your to your question to me, how 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 have I changed? Uh, let's start with uh, with with my good fortune, uh, the family I was born into, uh, a father who said, uh, "Say what you mean and mean what you say." Also, being born in uh, Detroit, Michigan, uh, growing up at the moment of Motown's innovations, and then growing up during the period of the 1970s and being able to witness the uh, development of disco and also the American film renaissance in the 70s. And then, and also British punk music, uh, the American acceptance of reggae. And then in the 80s, uh, the efflorescence of pop music uh, that came out of England and also in American hip hop. Uh, these are the things that changed me. In each one of those periods, uh, the greatness of those art achievements are a challenge. And I'm kind of an apples and oranges critic. Uh, when I see a movie, uh, I think of music. When I listen to music, I think of movies. And I think I can, I think I can also always <laughs> judge one from the benefit of the other. Uh, they're not different to me. Uh, they're serious works of art all the time. And from the 70s, from the 60s, 70s, the 80s, uh, this is great stuff that challenged me as a, as a consumer, uh, as a listener, as a viewer, and as a thinker. And if, you paid if one paid attention to any of those developments in music and movies during those eras, and you still can whether or not you were, you were alive then, uh, your thinking has to develop and your thinking has to, has to adapt to, to what was serious and good in those art efforts. Mari, I know that you've been you've been reflecting on on what some of your your fellow panelists have been saying over the last little while. Do, do you have some things that you'd like to to add to the conversation? Yeah, thanks, Adrian. Um, and in fact, one of the things that I've been thinking about was the Daniel's reminder that at some point in time, I asked him, "What about the macro?" And when I heard him say that, I thought, I don't say that. <laughs> and in fact, I, I found myself in this conversation asking that. So I, um, so Daniel, thank you for the provocation. And um, I, in part, the, I think what Thinking While Black allows us to do is to, to, to ponder the incompleteness of social change in this moment, but also to think about how powerful it is to reflect on the life of two critical figures whose significance has mushroomed and impacted so many generations and how that is 
in itself a way to, to think about changing pedagogies. Uh, and I, I'm reflecting on Alyssa Trott's book, The Point is to Change the World, her interview um, with uh, a, a colleague who uh, is pondering the nature of social change. What, what is it that, that the future holds? What are our responsibilities and ethics? And, and so in part, I think Armand's story, Paul's story, it, it's a story about the individual and their relationship to Bob Marley and to Spike Lee's movie and to the, the many cultural products that are part of uh, the Black experience. But it's, it's also a, a story about in what way do these cultural products really hold the, the pieces that are potentially transformative. It speaks to the incomplete nature of change in this moment, 21st century, this moment in which we are, in which we are beneficiaries of many things, we stand on many shoulders, but that there's so much more there and, and that much of the work from the past, much of Armand's interventions, Paul's interventions are, are part of the completeness of the work ahead. And some of the work that I'm doing really points me to think about the, the importance of decolonial work, the importance of the, you know, the ongoing presence of empire and how it's manifest in, in so many other ways around us, with us. And, and, and so, yeah, maybe it's, it's a question about the macro, but it's about the interrelationship between words and things and forms and ways of theory building and, and types of dis disavowal that actually can, are productive of, of wonderful things. So maybe it's not just the metaphor of smuggling in that, that moment that, that Daniel suggests, but it's, maybe it's not a smuggle, but it's a bold face standing up to say, theory building takes a very different form. And it's not just replacing Kant with Gilroy or Bob Marley or Toni Morrison. It's about reconfiguring the ways that we understand knowledge in the first place. And so I suppose the, the macro here is about the, the, the pieces and the capillary nature of power and how that maps on to the, the modes of change, the, the institutions of change that are some of which are crumbling, some of which are holding firm, and that we continue to 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 provoke and and um, and call into question. And so, yeah, it's it is the these micro macro meso processes that at play, that are at play. And I think that the that thinking while back really is an invitation to to to, to ponder those interconnections. We have a question from YouTube, and the question is, uh, says this, Dr. McNeil, how, how would you like students to approach your work? So I'd maybe step back and just think maybe a little bit about who I wish to reach with this book. Maybe that's another way to approach this question. So one of the things I say in the acknowledgements is uh, I wish I'd had access to the provocative work of Armand and Paul as a teenager. And part of how I'd really appreciate students to think about this work is to think about maybe particularly in a Canadian context but in other contexts too we're often struggling and this can connect to maybe Kamari's reflections around the macro we're often encouraged to talk about what aren't we being taught in schools right what's not on the curriculum there's not enough black history we're not being told about um these historical engagements and struggles and part of what i'd hope that this book also helps us to think about is that it's unlikely that 
certain state formations um, that are invested in white supremacy are going to tell us that information. But part of what we can do is to continue to search out and to struggle, and as Armand said, to think for ourselves, to address what we're not being, um, what's not being shared with us. So I would very much be keen for people to say, I've felt isolated, I've felt alienated. Here are examples of people I'd love to think with. Right? That's one way I loved how Adrian, you talked about classroom settings at the start of our conversation. Um, but really also thinking about all of the questions that have been raised about what is the cost of that, right? That cost of vigilance, searching, um, you know, the revolutionary power of curiosity and always asking questions. It means that certain things can't be taken for granted, but it also means that there is a exacting price, right? But as Armand has, has said, that exacting price does not just come with um, costs, does not just come with hardship, it also comes with liberation. It also comes with um, an opportunity for us to grow. It also comes for, 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 it allows us the space and the time to think about new forms of belonging with each other. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give the, the, the final word to Armand because we're really rapidly coming up, coming up to closing time. Uh, so Armand, I know that you had something to say. Uh, well, first of all, my, my gratitude to all of you, to Kamari, Catherine, Daniel, Adrian, <clears throat> to all of you. And uh, Daniel, you reminded me of uh, the motto of the City Sun, which was speaking truth to power. Uh, this was in the 1980s, and it struck me at the time as, as original. <laughs> And now uh, the need to speak truth to power is, is, is still important, but now power has shifted. And so we have to think about who is powerful and who needs to be spoken to uh, in a way that benefits us all. Um, how's that? Okay. It's, it's, it's great. It's wonderful. Well, th th thank you. Thank you so much for that, Armand. And with that, I think it comes to the end of a really an extraordinary session. I, I, I'd like to thank our, our panelists, uh, Kamari Clark, Catherine McKittrick, and also I'd like to thank uh, Armand White, um, our special guest tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Armand, and, and thank you so much for the, the inspirational work that you've done for, for, for decades. So we, we do appreciate that. And, and, and of course, kudos to, to Professor Daniel McNeil from Queen's University for this new book of his that I'm showing you right now, Thinking While Black, translating the politics and popular culture of a rebel generation. Congratulations, Daniel, on this, this new work of yours. Uh, yes, we all have a, have a copy and we encourage people to, to pick it up. Uh, and, and a big thank you also to Between the Lines, uh, the publisher for, um, for organizing tonight's event, Sarah and the, and the team at Between the Lines. And, and now I see Daniel McNeil is showing me up, showing what a sharp, <laughs> sharp shooter he is in comparison to my unkempt self. Uh, I, I knew you'd have to show me up at some point this evening. Uh, but, but again, th thank you all. And, and thank you, our audience, for, for being so, so attentive and st sticking with us uh, throughout the last 90 minutes. Uh, so at this point, maybe I should just throw it quickly to Sarah uh, for a final word. Sarah, did you have anything, or, or Daniel, the two of you, if you have anything final to say? Um, I think we can just say on behalf of Between the Lines, thank you so much for, um, for all of you who attended and came out. And thank you to all of the panelists for such an incredible and then very interesting, amazing discussion. So thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.